Alrighty, so I, I'm pretty darn banged up. I'm pretty injured. Kiddos are s sick and sleeping, so what better time than to uh, dump some knowledge and teach you how to make a 2002 to 2008 KTM 50 fast. So there's not a whole lot to accomplish. Let's just jump right into it. So there's going to be uh, four main items we're going to address today. Well, I guess really three. The uh, first order of business, air going in. Second order of business, air going out, including spark arrestor. And then the third order of business is putting the power down. And that's going to be clutch mod. So this is going to be the bulk of the videos talking about this clutch, how I modified it. It's really not that hard. I think anybody could do it if they put their mind to it. And um, yeah, that's going to be the bulk of the video is teaching you how to fix the clutch to put the power down, right? Because anybody can bolt on parts to put power down. It's just whether or not you can do it reliably and consistently. And I believe I have solved the reliably and consistently problem of the 02 to 08. Uh, before we do that though, let's talk real brief. Is your kid ready to put down more power? Does your kid understand what the consequences of yanking that throttle are? Does your kid know what to do when they get spooked because they have yanked the throttle too hard? So if you can't answer those questions, be gentle with your children and teach them how to ride safely. Don't just hand them a scary fast dirt bike without first letting them get used to something that they can control. So that's all I'll say about that. Let's talk about the fun stuff, going fast. All right, so the first order of business to go fast is this 12 millimeter stock carb. This is a 50 mini adventure carb. The junior senior model, some of them had a 14. Um, and the SX model had a 19 millimeter carb. So what you're gonna wanna do, it's really easy, swap in the 19 millimeter carb. Don't screw with these things. This thing, look at that. That 12 millimeter hole, it's like the diameter of your pinky. So that's like trying to run a mile uh, with a straw in your mouth, breathing in and out just through the straw. You can only get so much air through such an itty bitty little hole to make power. So. First order of business, get rid of the 12 and buy the 19 and throw the 19 on. That's what I did. And I will put a link in the description for the most cost effective version of the PHBG Delorto 19 millimeter carb. Now this carb, it comes in a Delorto box. It's a genuine Delorto and it's got KTM and the part number. I'll throw up a picture of that here. Now the jetting inside the carb and the needle and the slide probably will not be matching stock. So what I do is I turn on the parts exploded views on the parts selling websites and I pull up the stock jetting for a 19 millimeter carb from a 2008 KTM SX50. And I just go from there. You start with the stock stuff, you test it, then you measure it. If you need a video on how to tune a carb, this is not the place. So go Google that and uh, learn how to tune a carb, they're not too hard. So that's the first order of business, get the air in. Now, second order of business is get the air out of the engine, get the exhaust out. First thing to check, the if so equipped, if your bike has a, a spark arrestor to be forest legal, make sure it's actually clean and clear and not packed full of burnt oil. Uh, when I bought this, the bike made like zero power and that's because it was totally clogged full of uh, black soot and it would, you couldn't, couldn't hardly see light through it. So I just took a torch, burned it off, cleaned it up, probably wire brushed it and uh, there you go. Make sure the exhaust can actually get out because when this thing's packed up, the exhaust can't go anywhere. Now, second order of business in the exhaust equation, expansion chamber, right? This is a stock 50 mini expansion chamber off the mini adventure from this one's actually an 05 now the stock uh, junior stock senior and the sx pipe those are those are an okay pipe if you got it 
you know, and it's in good condition, just run it. If you got this guy, try and get rid of it and get something better. Now, all pipes throughout all years, 02 to 08, are gonna fit on the same bikes. However, one caveat, um, I found, probably the last in the nation, a SXX expansion chamber pipe. And that guy comes with a much thinner exit stinger on the expansion chamber. So that SXX pipe, which is on Anna's bike, and I'll show a picture of it here, has a much thinner stinger, and it will not fit a stock muffler. So a muffler is not too hard to fabricate, so I enlisted some help from a neighbor, and we fabricated a muffler for, for the SXS pipe. And that doesn't take a whole lot of work, um, but man, that SXS pipe makes some serious power. So those are the easy bolt-on items to make sure your bike is making power. Oh, now comes the harder part, teaching you how to modify a stock clutch to work really well. So let's get into that. So a stock 50 mini adventure clutch will use these little itty bitty compression springs here. And these are springs that are soft enough that you can actually squeeze and compress. They're pretty weak. Now the junior senior SX models those guys are going to use the washer stack version of the clutch. Now the washer stack version works, however, the grit and, and dust that the clutch shoe is going to make when it rubs the drum, that works its way in between the washer on top and it gets wedged inside. Now you can see on mine here, I've actually cut holes in the side of mine and that's that kind of shows you what you would be seeing. Right now you're seeing a a custom spring we'll get into that in just a minute but uh, so the the SX junior senior washer stack version works but it is not reliable you have to pull these things apart all the time and clean out those washer stacks and then restack them in a precise order in order to be able to put the power down and that's that just gets ridiculous so putting the power down what what is the goal okay the goal is that the engine is in the power band once this clutch starts locking to the drum. What does that mean? Well, that means these shoes actually start sliding away from the center due to centrifugal acceleration. And once they start sliding away, they will contact the drum, which will drive the gears and drive the tire chain and drive the tire. So when these guys start accelerating outwards, they start trying to accelerate the drum. Now, there will come a certain point where these will lock to the drum surface and they will be a single moving part together. Now, if that locking happens when the 50cc two stroke motor is making, I don't know, six, seven, 8,000 RPM, it's barely making anything on its power curve. Let me, uh, let me drop a power curve and we'll show you what that looks like. All right, look at that. A totally scientifically accurate dyno graph. Nice. All right, so the way this is going to work, so this would be your horsepower output. This will be your RPM, 0 RPM, 11,000 RPM, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5,000 RPM, on down the line, right? So typical two-strokes, they make almost no power until all of a sudden they make a ton of power. Now, if you have a 50 mini adventure clutch, that clutch shoe is going to slide outwards, pushing against this very weak spring, and the very weak spring is going to lock to the hub, or the drum inside the inside the clutch, at about 6 to 7, so that's making, I don't know, somewhere in there, right? So that's maybe 3 horsepower, 2 horsepower, something like that. That's on par with what like a PW50 makes in bone stock form. So that's gonna be barely anything pushing you along. And there is no way to get into the RPM band unless the wheel speed traveling through the gears and the chains and the mesh matches with that clutch speed. So you have to be going, I don't know, 20, 30 miles an hour if that clutch is locked before you actually get to that 10,000 RPM power band. Okay, 
Let's break that down. Does that does that make sense? Maybe I should just show you. I'm gonna roll in a video here where I've got the old clutch setup with one of these older springs, and it's got around a 7,000 or so RPM lock. And I'm gonna roll on the throttle, wide open. <clears throat> clutch is gonna start locking up about 7,000. It's gonna be making almost no power. It's gonna take forever for the wheel speed to start to match with the engine speed. And once they do, uh, once the wheel speed and engine speed link up, it, the RPM is going to start climbing and then the bike's gonna take off because it just hits the power band finally, right? <laughs> The problem is when you're when you're in this low RPM, there is no way to get to the high RPM without the wheels getting there. So if you have a heavy rider or a hill or some nasty mud, you are going to be stuck in that low power band. It's just not going to go anywhere. There's just no way about it. So it's one way to think about it. If you're in a stick shift car and you put the gear selector in third gear, you can start the car in motion. It takes a lot of slipping and once you uh, actually let go of the clutch, the cl the tire speed is directly linked to the engine speed, and that might be at a couple thousand RPM, maybe one, one and a half, two, two and a half thousand RPM. If you floor it, it'll take forever for it to make power to actually go up to the, what is it, 60 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour in third gear, because you're pushing a, you know, two, three, four thousand pound car, and you're in the wrong gear ratio, right? And that's what happens if you try to start in third. You're fighting the entire resistance of the car with almost nothing being produced by the engine. And there's no way for the engine to make power until the wheels start actually traveling fast enough. Now, all the drag vehicles that are at the highest level use some form of slip, whether or not it is through a torque converter or through a slipper clutch or through a multi-clutch uh, assembly like, uh, like top fuel drag racers. Top fuel drag racers slip their clutches at around eight or nine thousand RPM the entire way down the track until the wheel speed locks with the clutch speed and then it really lights up. So all high-end racing is done on the slip. So you need to accomplish that same slip. When you get on that throttle, you want it to be zinging right around nine and a half to 10,000 RPM, depending on how your motor's built. Now, the people that have built motors, they probably know what they're doing, and their power curve might, might look something different like that. It might make way more power, you know, and it'll, it'll dip off some point. Depends on how well the motor's built, right? So the people that have really built motors, they might want the clutches to lock up at 11 rather than nine and a half. But nine, nine and a half is really good for stock, uh, stock motors. So that's, that's what we're targeting. We want our clutch RPM to lock up near that peak horsepower range, if we can get it to. Now, what that will do, you will either continue slipping the clutch until you get up to speed, and this is gonna be a function of rider weight. So if you put a really big heavy rider uh, on the bike, it's gonna slip the clutch rather than slip the tire. But if you put a really light rider on, it will slip the tire rather than the clutch if you're at full throttle. So that's where throttle control comes in play for a newbie rider. If your kiddo does not know how to do throttle control, they're just gonna blow the tire off instantly. However, if you have a newbie rider that also does not know throttle control and they're at a low RPM lockup, they will blow the tire off when they're going 10, 15, 20 miles an hour down the track. Because all of a sudden, the bike's gonna hit a power band and it's gonna instantly break the traction Ooh. off. And it's gonna get squirrely at high speed. Now, I'm of the mindset that it is safer to no throttle control and have your slip happen at a slow speed. I feel it's much safer if your tire slips at 3 miles an hour rather than at 20 miles an hour. 
but that's just me. I think it's better to teach your kid how to ride safely and give them the tools to do so effectively and let them learn from there. So that's how these clutches work. The shoes move outwards, fighting a spring. When they move outwards, they spin the wheel. Okay, depending on the RPM that this engages, either this thing is putting out torque and horsepower or it's just not. There's barely anything down there. You don't want to be down here. So how do you get away from down there? Well, you make it harder for these clutches to go outwards and push into the clutch drum and spin the drum. How do you make it harder? Well, you need this guy to travel outwards later. How do you accomplish that? So there's a few different things that are gonna affect whether or not this shoe travels outwards. Now, the, the biggest driving factor is the uh, centripetal acceleration from rotational velocity. Now, rotational velocity is gonna uh, generate an acceleration outwards. The acceleration outwards is going to push uh, against the mass of the shoe. That's one. The spring resistance of the shoe, that's two. And then the distance it has to travel, there's number three. And then the viscosity of the fluid that is in between the clutch shoe and the drum. Now, those are your four items that this clutch shoe has to overcome in order to contact the drum and then start spinning the drum. Now, you can start simplest by trying oils. You can try different weight oils, different types of oils to see how that works. That's a really easy way to do it. Now, everything from there gets harder. So one important thing to note is that this relationship of centripetal acceleration and mass resistance and spring resistance is not necessarily a linear relationship. As this shoe travels outwards, the radius from center of rotation to center of mass changes, right? It's gonna get bigger on its radius the further out it travels. The further out it travels, the harder the rotational inertia is flinging it outwards. So it is a non-linear relationship. Once this guy starts moving, it's gonna start moving fast because the velocity squared uh, component is gonna really start pushing those springs. First thing I tried was I tried lightening up the shoes. So this is a stock shoe, totally stock, never been used. I tried drilling holes. This is cast aluminum mostly. Most of the weight though is coming from these pins here. Now these are hardened steel pins. I could not drill them. If I could have drilled them, I would have drilled them. So lightening the shoes, didn't work. I tried putting holes in the tops, didn't work. Not worth it. So what do you have left? You got viscosity, weight reduction, that doesn't work. Then you've got springs and then you've got distance traveled. So next thing to tackle is springs. So stock springs, very weak. These guys, next step up, much thicker wire, much harder to squeeze. That works a little bit. Next step up, this is harder to see. This is actually a longer spring, so you have to squeeze it really hard to get it in there. And I, this might have been a slightly stiffer wire too. So that's got some fairly good stiffness. So both of these options helped, but they were not the solution. The solution I've got right now, let me turn off my heat lamp so you can see a little better. This is a die spring. Now, difference between a die spring and a compression wire spring is that the wire used on the compression spring is round. If I was to snip this in half and then look at it, that's a round wire. This guy here is a square, a square wire. So there is a lot more mass in the spring assembly to push against. So if you try to squeeze this, you will be hard pressed, look at that. You'll be hard pressed to find any movement in this spring. Mm, man, yeah, I was squeezing hard and this thing hardly moves at all. Now, one thing to note, oh, this guy is wider and longer. This is, I think, a 15 millimeter, and this should be a 16. So, in order to use these, it takes a little bit of modification. <clears throat> now, first thing you gotta do is grind off the paint and take a little bit of metal away too. These are, so like I said, this is cast aluminum, and cast holes 
uh, or tapered holes. So at the top of the hole, it's gonna be one diameter. There we go. Top of the hole, it will be one diameter. Bottom of the hole, different diameter. And I can't get a caliper in there to actually measure that. This guy doesn't wanna actually go all the way down due to the paint and a little bit of uh, material uh, size differences. So, way to solve that, very easy. There, grinder. That's how you solve this problem. So, to do so, you take your spring, you take a metal implement like this, could be round. Uh, this is just what I've had laying around right now. And you turn on the grinder and you spin it on this shaft and you let it spin free and you can put pressure on this thing and you can grind the metal away in a fairly uniform manner and you can reduce its thickness in order to fit within the stock shoe. Now you could probably also, what I would kind of like to do in the future, I'd like to get probably a 16 millimeter flat bottom end mill and just run it in there because there's not a whole lot that needs to come away and this cast aluminum is super easy to remove material. Now, that's not it though. You also have to trim these. If I trimmed them to the 22 millimeter length, which is what this should be, vice the stock length, which should be a 20. So, that's the way I solved that. And uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure having a hole in the side of this thing is actually a critical design feature that should be there. Any clutch material that gets in there needs somewhere to go out. If it doesn't have anywhere to go out, it's gonna sit there and it's gonna get in between the um, clutch spring surfaces and you don't want that. Now, if you shave more off of this, you are gonna get less uh, stiffness and if you leave more, you will have more stiffness. However, you have to be careful because the more spring material you leave in place, the less width you're gonna have between, the less material you're gonna have between these spring surfaces, right? So the tighter it gets, the spring's gonna bind and it's gonna stop moving. So that's what we wanna avoid. So I mean, that's not too complicated, is it? You can get spring stiffness, you can get die springs in a 16 by 25 and all kinds of different stiffnesses. And of course, I'm gonna put links in the description for these. Um, these things are a really good option in my opinion. I'm getting a little cold, so I'm gonna turn my heat lamp back on. This is a good option, highly recommend. Now, there's that option number four that we still have yet to talk about. And that is increasing the distance that the shoe has to travel. Now, I'm not gonna pull this clutch apart today, but this clutch shoe is actually shaved on the bottom side, 40 thousandths of an inch. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up because the more that this guy has to move, the harder it has to work to overcome spring pressure to get there. Now, I have not tried a non 40 thousandths inch shoe, just a stock shoe with holes in it, and the red springs. I haven't tried that yet. I'm not sure, but I think you'll get some fairly good performance with just a red spring and a stock shoe. I haven't tried it without shaving yet. I haven't needed to. I've been waiting for these shoes to get, you know, blown out, and they just haven't. So, I've been waiting on that. Now, in order to accomplish a 40,000 shave off on a stock shoe, you need a little itty bitty jig to hold the shoe in place, square and flat within a vise. So I designed and printed this little itty bitty uh, 3D printable tool holder, which is gonna square the tool, uh, square the workpiece against the shaft, more or less, and it is narrower than the shoe so that when you clamp it in a vise, you're gonna set it down and then you clamp it on the sides. That's gonna hold it very square to the top face. And you know, it actually doesn't matter very much if this surface is square with the pins. Because once this guy's in motion and it starts accelerating outwards, it doesn't matter whether it started square or not because once it moves, it just straightens up against the bottom of the hole against the spring. So it's really not a big deal. And this cast aluminum is so soft 
I haven't done it yet. When I when I did this job, I did it at a neighbor's with a little tiny uh, three-axis manual mill. I'm willing to bet you could do this operation with a good with a good vise in a drill press with an end mill in the chuck. As long as you don't hog into the thing with huge uh, depths of cuts, you should be able to take tiny little passes in a regular drill press with a regular uh, uh, drill chuck call it as long as you don't go ham with the thing and uh, try to do the whole pass all at once if you're gentle with it it should work so link to the file in the description below uh, like I said I'm sorry I haven't tested a stock shoe set with red springs but still having holes drilled in the side I really think the holes in the side is the winning ticket to keep the oil clean uh, and the grime out of the spring surfaces. So Anna has put maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 or so hours on these red springs and it's been a consistent clutch engagement the whole time, assuming the oil's clean. Uh, the, once the oil starts getting really, really dirty, it'll it'll lower its lockup RPM a little bit, but that's easy enough. Every, uh, every mini bike is going to have that as the clutch oil gets filthy, the uh, RPM that it locks up starts uh, tapering off. So, but that's it. There's really not much to it. So the only other thing to talk about is show you what the differences are. So I'll show you what a stock spring looks like. I think I still have some footage of testing with the stock spring. And then uh, these uh, modified springs, I'll show you what I got. And then I'll show you what just red springs do. Oh, and to caveat all that, most of my testing was done with the stock low power pipe. Now with the low power pipe and red springs, I think I got to about an 83 or 8400 RPM clutch lockup with the red springs and uh, and uh, then once I switched over to the new pipe and the red springs and the shaved shoes, I got about a 9000, 9100 RPM clutch lockup consistent. So I'll see if I can find some footage of that and I'll throw it in here. Yeah, baby. There's really not that much to it. It's it's uh, a multifaceted problem. The oil's got to be good, got to be clean enough oil. Springs got to be working. So washer stacks work, but they get dirty quick. You could try just cutting the hole and see if they stay cleaner longer. That's that's totally worth it. Worth testing that. So you've got oil, springs, and distance traveled. Those are your three things that I would focus on to make your clutch work, to put that power down so that you're making power when they get on that bike, when they get on the throttle. So in my opinion, doing clutch modification makes the older KTM 50 platform a totally viable platform and a very cheap platform. They have a very bad reputation because of this clutch shoe and the either super weak mini adventure spring or the real pain in the butt washer stacks. So in my opinion, you can get a very cheap bike that is, you know, not necessarily just as good. There's still a lot of benefit in those newer water-cooled bikes, but you can get a really darn good bike for really cheap. And it really doesn't cost a lot to make these things work. So one thing you can do, you could take this spring here, this stiffer 22 millimeter spring, and you can add washer stacks to a beginner rider. This is still a 15 millimeter, it's, it fits right in. No modification required, although I'd still probably drill the hole in the side to keep it clean, right? This is gonna take some work to, to actually squeeze down and, and get the threads to engage. 
In my opinion though, this is gonna revitalize the old platform for, for those that wanna race and practice on the cheap. So if you use this guy, you can add washers to the stack and you can squeeze this guy harder and you can get a, a fairly good, you know, high sevens, low to mid 8,000 RPM lockup, which is a fairly conservative lockup if that's your goal. And if you want to let your rider learn on a choked up carb to where it doesn't make any power at the top end or a restricted pipe so that doesn't hit when it does uh, make power, you could, you could keep this stuff relatively stock with a better spring so you're not stuck in the five to 6,000 RPM range with the super weak spring. So in my opinion, this is a totally vital way to accomplish this. I think the spring set, I think it came in a set of five or so and it might have been, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 bucks. Not bad. This was a set of 10. These were a little more expensive, but if you want to go fast, this is the way to do it. And there's a lot more different die springs in the 16 by 25 size range, have much different thick, uh, stiffnesses. And the main thing you want to watch for is total usable, uh, squeezable length. You want to make sure you're uh, actually going to be able to uh, have this shoe travel. You could get the stiffest spring in the world, but the gap between it's going to be too tiny and you're not actually going to be able to uh, have the shoe move. But anyway, that's what you look for. So I think this uh, this is a totally good option for someone racing on a budget, learning on a budget, doesn't want to invest the $5,000 plus dollars on a new KTM 50. So that's it. I think this is, I think this is a, a great deal finding an old 02 to 08 KTM 50 and modifying the clutch to make it reliable. So there you have it.